So some of my objectives today um, to talk a little bit about recent re research findings on mental health and service needs for people who are homeless, um, to increase awareness of interventions um, for people who are homeless and who are living with mental health issues, and to improve the quality of care um, and expand knowledge of resources for people who are homeless and living with mental health issues. Mental health recovery is a journey um, of healing and transformation, enabling a person with a mental health problem to live a meaningful life in a community of his or her choice uh, while striving to achieve his or her full potential. So it's about people uh, living the best life that's possible for them. And I think that's uh, very much at the heart of what we want to do um, in working with people who are suffering from mental health issues and, and have been or are currently homeless. Um, and key to this um, recovery approach um, is uh, that we respect um, people's choices and their self-direction and autonomy, um, that we take an individualized approach um, and that be person-centered. So um, that's really the approach that I take on the team that I work on. Um, and that we work towards empowerment. Certainly uh, people who are coping with homelessness and mental health issues are often very much marginalized um, from mainstream society and, uh, and don't feel um, uh, and don't have a lot of power. So I think one of the big approaches is to work with people to support them in, um, in having their voice heard. Um, taking a holistic view that it's not just looking at mental health, it's not just looking at physical health, it's not just looking at housing, it's not just looking at spirituality, but uh, all the different components together is very important. And seeing the whole person um, and all the different interests they had. And part of the reason I brought up that I'm a baseball fan is that's, you know, some aspect of my identity is about being a baseball fan. And um, so I'm not just, you know, a psychiatrist and I'm not um, just, uh, you know, a physician, but, you know, that's another aspect of my identity, just like people who are suffering um, from mental health issues and dealing with homelessness, they have many different aspects to their identity. Um, and then uh, non-linearity refers to the fact that for anyone on the road to recovery, it's a bumpy road. Um, there's ups and downs, and that's true for any of us in all of our lives, we know that there's ups and downs. So why should it be any different for people with mental health issues um, who are homeless, that it's not gonna be a straight line pass of things just getting better and better and better, that there's gonna be ups and downs and setbacks that occur along the way, and that's actually part, um, that's understood to be part of, um, of the journey. Um, trying to take a strength-based approach, not just looking at where people have problems or deficits or symptoms, but focusing on what strengths and talents do people have and working to build on those. Um, peer support is huge, and um, it was wonderful at the conference I was at, uh, the Housing First Conference in Chicago. Um, there were peer supports from all over uh, North America, and also um, I went to one uh, talk that was given by peer support workers from France, and that's a new, uh, new thing for France to have. Um, formal peer support workers involved in their mental health programs. So, and that, but that's definitely an approach in terms of having people with lived experience of homelessness and lived experience of dealing with mental health issues be part of the service delivery team at, at all different levels. And, um, and that's key to having a successful um, approach. Um, respect, um, respecting people's dignity as people, um, responsibility, uh, individual's personal responsibility and people's responsibility to each other. Um, as, and then probably one of the most important things is hope and instilling hope because certainly many people dealing with mental health issues who, um, and also dealing with homelessness often feel a lot of hopelessness. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, but um, certainly working on um, instilling hope and um, giving people reasons to be hopeful and sometimes holding on to hope when people are feeling hopeless is a, a very big part. And certainly having um, people with lived experience of homelessness and mental health issues be involved in services those people can act as role models in terms of um, helping with, with hope and, and, uh, and for people to see that things can get better. Um, so I just want to also mention, uh, I didn't say at the beginning, so in terms of my work, I work on um, a Housing First um, assertive community treatment team that was part of the At Home Chez Soi study. Um, that was uh, a national project, which we're going to be talking about a little bit later. And I've been working on that team for the last five years as the psychiatrist, um, well, one of the two psychiatrists on that team, and working alongside peer support workers, case managers, nurses, um, to provide care to people who um, have been homeless and dealing with mental health issues and providing a housing first approach to get people housed as quickly as possible. 
Um, just briefly, um, in terms of definitions of homelessness, there's people who are absolutely homeless, um, living on the street or in places unfit for habitation. Um, and then there's people that are at risk of homelessness, people that spend more than 50% of their total income on housing costs. And there's also the hidden homeless. Um, and those are people staying temporarily with friends or family, um, often hear the term uh, couch surfing. So these are people that don't have a fixed address, but um, you know are, are uh, bouncing around um, between friends and family, um, or, um, or sometimes just people they met, met along the way. Um, and uh, those people can be hard to exactly determine what the numbers are for those people. Um, overall, it's estimated that approximately 200,000 people in Canada are, are homeless um, and living in shelters or on the streets. And on any given night, it's estimated that about 40,000 people stay in homeless shelters across Canada. Um, in Toronto, that number, um, when they did a count in 2009, they estimated that the total number of homeless on a given night, so this one night um, in Toronto, was uh, 5,086. Um, again, that might be an underestimate in terms of not being able to count some of those hidden homeless people. Um, it probably is. Interestingly, um, when I was at the conference in Chicago, I met someone from um, Honolulu, uh, Hawaii, and um, Honolulu is a lot smaller city than Toronto, but they said that he, he said that they had about 5,000 homeless in Honolulu. So, um, so homeless numbers differ depending on locality, and obviously the challenges of um, providing um, help and care to the homeless population in Toronto is different than in somewhere like Honolulu. Um, overall, when they did the count in 2009, about 80% of the people were staying in shelters, about 8% um, were staying outdoors, and then um, another uh, roughly 5% were either in health or treatment facilities or in correctional facilities, uh, jails or prisons. Um, and overall in Toronto, over the course of a year, there's about 28,000 individuals who use shelters each year. Um, of those, about 50% are single men, 20% single women, 20% um, are ch parents with children, and 10% are youth age 15 to 24. Um, but the numbers of those, the overall the homeless population tends to be a younger population, although that's changing um, over time that uh, the numbers of people um, over the age of 50 amongst the homeless population um, are growing. And I think that also speaks to the overall demographic trend um, uh, in terms of our population aging. Um, so why do people become homeless? Um, if uh, I don't want to focus so much on the numbers here, um, uh, and these numbers add up to more than 100% because people have different reasons for why they become homeless. But uh, when people are asked, um, you know, over half cited economic reasons, um, about one third cited unsafe or poor living conditions for why they became homeless, a quarter described uh, being evicted or conflict with their landlord, um, and then another quarter described uh, drug or alcohol use. Um, and then about one-fifth described relationship or family breakdown as a reason for becoming homeless. Um, uh, about 13% uh, described institutionalization, so being institutionalized either in a correctional facility or in a hospital leading to their homelessness. Um, and then uh, some people talked about lack of support to keep their housing. And in terms of why people, so that's why people become homeless. In terms of why people stay homeless, 80% um, 80, 80 described economic reasons are the reasons. So, Certainly the lack of um, income to be able to pay for rent and uh, the lack of affordable housing are, are major reasons. Um, and you know, the number one reason why people are staying homeless. Um, and then about one third talked about mental and physical health conditions as a reason why they were staying homeless. And uh, one quarter talked about lack of suitable housing, so safe and affordable housing um, for why they were remaining homeless. And then 11% uh, described the housing waiting list as being too long, which in general, in Toronto, anyone who works in this area knows the housing waiting list is too long um, for, um, for affordable housing. Um, and also lack of adequate support to help people to find and keep housing. And then 7% also talked about discrimination uh, being a major issue for them in terms of staying homeless. And 6% talked about lack of having ID for them to be able to, um, uh, to obtain a home. Um, so you know, overall, there's definitely a shortage of social housing um, in uh, Toronto, and uh, and this is also true across a lot of North America in terms of a shortage of affordable housing. Um, and in terms of access to income supports, uh, when they ask people who are homeless, 
Um, actually, over half said they had uh, no major government benefits. And then there were some that were on ODSP and some that were on Ontario Works. Um, you know, and, and overall, there had been uh, cuts to social assistance, which further made it more difficult for people to uh, be able to you know, pay for housing. Um, and so, you know, if you can't, um, uh, if you can't, uh, have affordable housing, then people, um, end up staying homeless. And there are some people who, um, don't like staying in shelters and prefer to stay outdoors, um, or on the streets if the weather's, uh, better, but it's not that they're preferring to stay outdoors or on the streets if they could find affordable housing. So that's a misconception. One of the myths is that, um, that some people in the general public have is that the people who are homeless and on the streets, that that's what they prefer or want. And that's a complete myth. The vast, vast majority of people who are homeless, when they're asked, they would like to have safe, affordable housing. Um, in terms of homelessness and health, um, so um, homeless people are more likely to experience compromised mental health. And uh, that's for a variety of uh, reasons. Um, uh, for some people, um, the reason that they became homeless in the first place, in addition to the lack of affordable housing, um, has been to issues around their mental health issues, sometimes through ending up being hospitalized and then um, through being hospitalized, uh, not paying their rent, and then ending up homeless that way or, um, or other ways that through institutionalization. But um, other aspects that compromise people's mental health when they are homeless are the high stress levels, um, involved in being homeless, the focus on a day-to-day -day basis for people who are homeless is on surviving that day um, or that hour. And uh, that leads to very high stress levels. Um, uh, some people have, uh, I don't even like the term maladaptive coping styles. They have coping styles that uh, that are, are difficult, um, but they're, they're, people are doing the best that they can in their given situations to cope with their mental health issues, their addictions issues, their high stress levels, and it's a, a challenging environment for people who are homeless who are just trying to survive on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, limited uh, perceived supports, I would just say limited supports, period, not just perceived, but limited supports, um, and often a uh, sense of poor self-esteem, um, and, uh, and then suicidal behavior is um, fairly common amongst people who are homeless. And I think this, uh, again, speaks to the level of hopelessness that people who are homeless um, experience. Um, and again, the importance of, of working to um, increase hope and, and working together to help meet the needs of people who are homeless and dealing with mental health issues. Um, overall, when it's been said, they found that one quarter to one third of homeless individuals have a serious mental illness. So when I say serious mental illness, um, these are people who meet, meet criteria for disorders such as schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, severe bipolar disorder. Um, that's not to say that the other 75 to 67 percent of homeless people don't have other mental health issues um, or and or addictions issues, uh, which are also quite common. In terms of other um, significant uh, health issues amongst the homeless population, um, tuberculosis, um, there are higher rates um, in the homeless population. Hepatitis C is 30 times higher than in the Canadian population, and HIV um, is uh, 300 times higher than in the Canadian population. So certainly uh, much higher rates um, amongst the homeless than in the general population um, for these uh, significant um, illnesses. Um, in terms of uh, factors that affect people's health, certainly a major one is poverty. Um, and isolation is another major one. Uh, stress we talked about, um, nutrition. So if you don't have um, enough money for rent, you often don't have enough money to pay for um, decent nutrition. Um, violence and injury, the rates of, um, of violence amongst people are, who are, the rates of being victims of violence amongst people who are homeless are much higher than the general population. And many people who are homeless um, have suffered from uh, traumatic brain injury as a result of injuries they've sustained um, either prior to becoming homeless or during the course of their homelessness. Um, density and crowding are factors as well as exposure to the elements. And obviously this has been a particularly harsh winter in Toronto. Um, uh, when they've studied uh, shelter users in Toronto um, and asked them about uh, their experiences of mental um, health issues and substance use issues, 
they found um, that among shelter users in Toronto, 60% had reported a lifetime diagnosis of a mental illness, and 6% reported a diagnosis of schizophrenia, um, and then uh, almost 70% reported a diagnosis of a substance use disorder, um, and about 29% um, had met criteria for antisocial personality disorder. And um, one of the most um, startling statistics I found was that 10% of the sample of homeless people had attempted suicide in the previous year. So again, speaking to the, I think, to the level of um, hopelessness that people are experiencing in this population and um, unmet needs. Um, in terms of physical health conditions, um, uh, three quarters reported to have at least one condition and um, over 50% had reported having two or more physical health conditions. So uh, when working with people who are homeless, it's not just working with people in terms of mental health issues, but also physical health issues. And it's important that we have an integrated approach across the board um, in terms of combining uh, working with people to address their physical health needs and mental health needs simultaneously, as well as their other needs, social needs, spiritual needs, all of this together. Yeah, and as uh, these statistics demonstrate, you know, um, in terms of chronic health conditions such as uh, heart disease and diabetes and asthma, um, that people who are homeless have higher rates than in the general population. Um, and uh, speaking about safety and, and being the victim of violence, um, one in three had reported that they'd been assaulted in the past year, and one in five women reported that they had been sexually assaulted, and one in five um, reported that they'd had um, a negative experience with hospital security at some time. So even in an environment where they feel like they should be safe, like a hospital, uh, people don't always feel um, safe. Um, in terms of uh, the overall clinical implications are that people um, who are homeless um, are dealing with a whole variety of challenges, um, both in terms of physical health needs and mental health needs and housing needs and financial needs. Um, nutrition needs, and you know we need to come up um, and work together to provide um, you know innovative, collaborative, integrative care for people um, who are homeless and dealing with mental health issues, um, and address the gaps in care. And we need to make sure that we're providing an individualized approach that's matching um, the person that we're working with to the level of care that they need. Um, so. This gentleman appears to be sleeping out on the street. He's got a sleeping uh, uh, sleeping bag around his uh, his legs and waist, and um, and in terms of uh, so this gets to the access to care issues. In terms of health service utilization by homeless people, um, where do homeless people go for care? So um, over half said that they um, this, this is people self report. Over half said they go to the emergency department for care. Um, and 44% uh, said they do go to a doctor's office, so um, that's encouraging that people um, are finding they are able to go to doctor's offices to receive care. Um, many receive services in shelters and drop-ins, um, as well as from health buses. Um, uh, one third talked about getting care at community health centers. Um, and one third talked about using walk-in clinics. About one quarter talked about hospitalization as um, a way that they were accessing care. Um, and then a smaller percentage talked about using hospital outpatient clinics. And then um, about 6% talked about using Aboriginal health centers. And uh, other people talked about using alternative health. Um, so in terms of um, uh, the most common reasons for ER visits by homeless clients, uh, mental health and behavioral issues were the um, uh, were the most common reason for ER visits by homeless clients. Um, and of, of those visits, um, about half were the result of substance use, and uh, about one in five were the result of a psychotic um, disorder. So people, um, I think there's an indication that <coughs> people aren't getting their um, service needs always met in the community and then are accessing ER resources to get their... Um, their health needs met. Um, and overall, um, in 0506, it was found that roughly half of hospitalizations um, were for mental disease and disorders amongst the, the homeless population. Um, and I'm, the hospital I work at, which is St. Michael's Hospital, um, it was found that 
uh, persons who are homeless account for about 15 to 17% of all ER visits. And when they did a count in 2010, uh, one quarter of admissions to the psychiatric inpatient unit were for people who were of no fixed address, so essentially um, homeless. So, so, you know, very high rates of, um, of homeless people lack, um, uh, being involved in acute mental health services. Um, so uh, now we're going to talk about the issue about access to health care and what some of the barriers are that, um, uh, that was brought up. So the barriers can be patient related, they can be uh, program and provider related, and also system related. Um, and of note, uh, three quarters of homeless individuals with a mental illness uh, were found not to have received psychiatric outpatient care in the previous year. Uh, that was based on uh, a prior study. Um, so in terms of barriers to care for the client, um, sometimes uh, the person who's homeless mental health issues the symptoms of their um, illness um, act as a barrier to care. So if the person's feeling depressed and demoralized, um, it can make it less likely they would go to access care um, or feeling hopeless, uh, you know, which, which all of which are symptoms of depression. Um, if the person's feeling very anxious, um, uh, sometimes socially anxious so that they, they, don't, they feel scared to have social interactions, and sometimes particularly with people in positions of authority, um, that could make it less likely to access care and, um, and sometimes psychotic symptoms make it less likely for people to access care, um, including you know, if the person's uh, paranoid about people that are in a position of authority um, or about going to a hospital or seeing a doctor, um, and that could make it less likely. Um, also, many people have had experience of a loss of personal um, dignity and control when they have tried to access services. Um, so having had that personal experience makes in the past, it makes them less likely to want to access care in the future. So, um, you know, I think it's incumbent upon all of us working with people to set a tone of respect and respecting people's dignity um, and respecting their choices and working with them on their goals and creating a welcoming environment when people are accessing care, regardless of what the setting is. Because um, if we don't, then people are um, much less likely to, to seek out care. Um, and many people are homeless also experience a sense of uh, isolation. Um, and then, of course, there's huge uh, stigma for people who are homeless. Uh, there's a stigma around being homeless, for one. Uh, and then for people with mental health issues, on top of that, there's a stigma around having mental health issues. And then uh, for people who also have um, alcohol or substance use issues, on top of that, there's a stigma around that. So um, uh, so there's multiple levels of this stigma. In terms of uh, provider barriers to care, so uh, many providers feel like they have a lack of adequate resources in order to be able to um, help people who are homeless with mental illness. And then overall, our system has generally been geared towards um, an acute care model, um, even though the issues that most people who are homeless with mental health issues face are um, generally chronic health issues, um, both chronic physical health issues and chronic mental health issues. And our system isn't really designed for that, both in terms of you know ER and hospitals. Um, you know, I think that's gradually changing as more and more of our um, the healthcare issues across across the population tend to be more chronic issues, but it's still um, still the case that historically our system has been more designed towards acute care. Um, uh, there's been an absence of uh, uh, of positive reinforcers for uh, providers to provide care for homeless populations, um, and uh, it's also been studied that uh, some providers um, uh, react with uh, protect what what's termed in this study, protective withdrawal um, from people and uh, that there's a perceived uh, lack of, um, of uh, personal control and working uh, with uh, uh, persons who are homeless. In terms of uh, the client perspective, um, when clients were asked in 2007, um, more than a quarter reported that they had been refused health care at some point and more than a third felt that they had been treated with disrespect by a care provider in the, in the past year. And uh, one in five, as I mentioned before, one in five had had a negative experience with hospital security. So obviously people have felt like, um, have tried to access care and then had poor experiences, it's gonna make it less likely that they're gonna access care in the future. Um, and then there are sy systemic barriers to accessing care, um, including uh, lack of uh, supportive and supported housing, 
um, the lack of financial support, um, you know, including having the financial resources to um, take transportation to get to appointments, um, and uh, and lack of convenient and efficient data systems to be able to provide uh, coordinated uh, continuity of care for persons who are homeless. Um, so some of the other reasons that people have cited for not using mental health services um, uh, that homeless people have reported are not knowing where or what services to use, um, feeling embarrassed about using services. Again, this speaks to the, the stigma issue. Um, not having money to get to the service, so having money for transportation. Um, fears that the service provider uh, would contact family or police um, or a social worker. So concerns about the person's wishes about who's contacted in, in a situation where they're accessing care um, and about confidentiality. Um, uh, be think, believing that the service would not help them um, and concerns that they had about the cost of the service. Um, and in terms of not obtaining medications, uh, reasons that were cited by people who are homeless with mental health issues were that, um, or people who are homeless in general, were that they couldn't afford them, um, that they didn't have a drug benefit card, um, that drug benefits didn't cover the item that they needed, um, or that they didn't know where to, to get um, medications or to get a uh, drug benefit card. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously it's, in Ontario it's important to have um, a health card um, generally to access all covered services. And 34% um, of homeless people I report that they didn't have a health card. Um, many of them they had lost, it was lost or stolen. Um, some were waiting for a new card and some had the, had the card had expired. So, um, but that's quite a substantial percentage of the homeless population, one third that um, did not have a health card. And 28% uh, reported that they'd been refused health care in the previous year because they didn't have a health card. And um, then other identification documents are, are also important um, for people in obtaining services. Um, so loss of documents can be a major barrier for people as well. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about the importance of, you know, the ID clinics that exist in the city in terms of helping people to get their ID so they can then access the services that they need. Um, so unfortunately, our gentleman is still um, waiting here and uh, has not gone to access services. And, uh, you know, one wonders about which barriers um, this gentleman might have faced in terms of uh, trying to access services in the past. Um, so next I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, approaches towards providing quality care to persons um, who are home with mental health issues. Um, so I uh, just want to uh, briefly give like uh, give an example. Um, so uh, this homeless person, let's call her Sandy. Sandy's a 35-year-old homeless woman with a psychotic illness. Uh, epilepsy and occasional cannabis and crack cocaine use. Um, she was brought to the ER by police um, and she was hospitalized for 10 days um, and treated with an antipsychotic and an anti-epileptic medication. And now the treatment team in the hospital is considering the following. Um, so one option that they're considering is to give her a list of homeless shelters. Um, uh, another group in the treatment team is saying, you know, we need to treat her addictions issues first as a step towards housing. And uh, a third group is saying they need to refer to a family physician for follow-up uh, with these issues. Um, and a fourth group on the treatment team are saying, uh, don't do any of the above. It's unlikely that this person's going to follow up with care or treatment um, and likely that they're going to improve is low. So um, uh, who likes option number one here? So it's not, not bad to give a person list of homeless shelters. I mean... Uh, it speaks to you know them having choice of uh, where they want to uh, to stay, um, but uh, is that really going to address you know her overall needs? Uh, probably not her overall needs, although uh, she may be able to access other services while in the shelters. Um, who likes option number two to urge her for treatment of her addictions as a step towards housing? So say you need to get your addictions treated first, and then we'll house you after. You know, people don't like that option. I don't, I don't like that option much either. And it's interesting. So just before coming here to give this talk today, um, I was um, in the community visiting one of my um, clients on my Housing uh, First Act team. Um, 
and she's been housed now for four years um, in the same apartment, stably housed, four years in, this, in the same apartment. And, and it's a nice apartment in a nice neighborhood in the west end of Toronto. Um, and uh, when I went to see her today, she had just smoked crack cocaine. And it was, you know, but she was very pleasant with me. She said, you know, uh, you might, uh, you might want to come back another day because, you know, um, I did just use. Um, so, but, you know, despite the fact that she was still using crack cocaine and still uh, drinking alcohol quite heavily, she had managed to maintain her same apartment for the last four years, which was, you know, a wonderful thing for her. And she appreciated having her, her own apartment um, and uh, having a safe place to, to stay. Um, so, uh, who likes option number three to refer to a family physician for follow-up? So certainly it'd be great to get her connected with, um, a primary care physician. I guess the issues are, you know, what, what will her ability be to follow up with that family physician? Um, if the family physician is trying to arrange an appointment with her, how are they going to contact her if she doesn't have a fixed address? Um, so, uh, I think one would have to look at where is this family physician located? How easy are they to access? Um, how comfortable um, and knowledgeable is that particular primary care physician in working um, with persons dealing with homelessness and um, mental health and addictions issues? So, you know, I definitely uh, think that primary care is very, very important for this population, but you need to make sure that the primary care that you're connecting people with is uh, primary care that's going to work for that person. Um, and who's... Uh, who likes option number four that none, none of the above are going to work um, and likely this person isn't going to improve even with treatment and support. So no one likes that option. I, I agree. That's a very pessimistic option. And the evidence um, is actually, you know, quite the opposite. People can and do get better with the uh, uh, right types of um, support. So um, I want to talk um, briefly about a number of different um, effective interventions. Um, and uh, that have been shown, that have been proven through um, uh, through a variety of studies to uh, to show effectiveness in working with persons who are homeless and have mental health issues. So um, we're going to talk about assertive community treatment, uh, respite care, um, housing first oriented approaches, uh, critical time interventions, and also improvements in discharge planning practices. That's not to say that this is an exhaustive list. There are other interventions and approaches out there. Um, but these are some of the interventions I'm going to be talking about. And then I hope um, at the end, I definitely want to leave enough, top, enough time for questions and discussion and for us to share ideas. So if people have um, other innovative approaches that they're using or have heard of, then let's talk about that. Um, so in terms of assertive community treatment, um, so uh, for those that don't know what assertive community treatment is, assertive community treatment involves a multidisciplinary uh, mental health team that has a shared caseload of patients, usually of, of clients, usually about um, 80 to 100 um, uh, clients that they're providing care for. Um, there's usually a psychiatrist uh, on the team as well, um, and nurses and case managers. Um, oftentimes there's a person with experience in um, uh, addictions and substance use issues, um, and they're working as a team to provide care for people. Um, who are experiencing significant mental health issues. So when this has been studied in persons who are homeless, they found that um, participants um, who were randomized to be on a certain community treatment team um, had a 37% greater reduction in days homeless um, and also reduction in their psychiatric symptom severity compared to regular case management. Um, although hospitalization outcomes didn't differ significantly between the groups. Um, and then in observational studies, so not randomized studies, but observational studies um, looking at people pre-treatment and then post-treatment, they found that there was a 104% reduction in homeless days for the people who were on ACT teams um, and a 62% reduction in symptom severity um, compared to um, before they joined the team. So um, ACT has been shown to be, um, this type of ACT, uh, uh, surgery treatment has been shown to be a, uh, an effective intervention for many people. Um, that's not to say that um, you know, again, I want to emphasize that uh, we definitely need, you know, individualized approaches for people and approaches where we're matching people's level, um, uh, matching people's service delivery level 
um, to the, their level of need. So, um, so a steroid community treatment is not for, for everybody, but um, can be effective for many people. Um, next, I want to talk about housing first, which I talked about a little bit at the beginning, and this is the type of team that I've been working on. I've actually been working on a team that combines a sort of community treatment um, form of uh, case management with housing first. And overall, housing first is a recovery-oriented model that puts consumer choice at the center of all considerations. So, um, so although it's called housing first, really, um, it should be called you know, what the person wants first. Um, you know, the majority of people who are homeless, uh, what they want first is housing. Um, but, uh, but if there's something else they want first as a team, we would address that need first, you know, before the housing. So if, uh, if they said, you know, before I want housing, I want to get reconnected with my family, we'd work to make that happen first if, that, if that's what they wanted. So it's about, you know, what, what are the client's goals and wishes? Um, so, and in terms of this approach, there's no conditions on housing readiness. So, you know, again, I gave the example of um, my client who's uh, continuing to struggle with addictions issues. Um, and we didn't say, oh, you need to, you know, get your um, alcohol use issue treated first before we can house you. We said, we're going to get you housed as quickly as possible, and then we can continue to work with you on the um, addictions issues. And at various times during our course, of uh, providing care for her, um, she has gotten um, off of crack cocaine and been looking better and doing better. And then she has setbacks. So we talked about the um, journey of recovery. It's not a you know um, continuous course of improvement all the way, but there's setbacks and relapses. Um, and I think you know um, for any of us trying to make any kind of change in our lives, it's usually not uh, an easy process. Um, and certainly more challenging for people who are dealing with a combination of um, addictions and mental health issues. Um, so, so one of the major tenets of Housing First is there's no conditions on housing readiness. They don't have to be receiving um, uh, medications. They don't have to be uh, sober. Um, the number one thing is to house the person as quickly as possible. Um, and uh, one of the big aspects is that we're housing them in a place of their choosing. So. Uh, we're not just saying, you know, you have to take this apartment. We found this apartment for you. You take it. They get to see the apartment first and decide, do they like this? And they have total veto power. If they say, I don't like this place. I don't like the neighborhood. I don't like um, this apartment building. Then we'll go with them to find another place. Um, and experimental studies of housing first um, have been shown to be associated with improved housing stability and um, increased quality of life. So, um, the uh, project that I was involved in the last five years was the, um, the At Home Shea Swa Housing First project. And that was a giant research demonstration project that took place across Canada um, uh, in five cities, Toronto, Vancouver, Winnipeg, Montreal, and Moncton. And the overall goals were to find the best ways to provide services for people who are homeless um, and dealing with significant mental health issues and to evaluate the effectiveness and cost effectiveness um, of, uh, of these approaches in different Canadian settings and with populations um, and, and different populations. They did a randomized design um, where uh, people had to give informed consent to be part of the study and they were told at the outset that there was a chance that they were going to be get into the housing first arm of the study which would involve um, them getting a subsidy for their rent um, as, as well as mental health services or there was a possibility in terms of being involved in the study, that they would get care as usual, which is the exact same care that they would get um, if the study didn't exist at all. So whatever resources they would ordinarily be able to find in their communities and cities, they would get that care. It wasn't that they were prevented from getting any kind of care, but they would uh, have access to all the usual resources that were in their city. Um, so and just in terms of the overall study, um, you know, over a thousand people were in the housing first branch of the study. And then uh, almost a thousand people were uh, randomized to the treatment as usual uh, branch of the study. Um, and just to speak a little bit about the housing aspect of things. So in this housing first approach, most of the housing that people had was uh, uh, scattered site apartments in the private sector that they would use their um, the housing subsidy money to, um, to pay for that apartment. Uh, but there was partnerships with the landlord. So landlords had to agree to be part of this project 
it wasn't that people were just um, randomly approaching landlords and saying, you know, I have this subsidy. Um, there was uh, a partnership um, with uh, housing connections from the city of Toronto to work with landlords to find landlords that were willing to be part of this, this study. And one of the reasons that landlords were willing to be part of the study was they're able to guarantee you are going to be getting this money every month. Um, and so landlords were happy that they knew that there was going to be a steady stream of them getting their rent paid. Um, so uh, as I mentioned before, personal choice is key to the model. So we'd ask people what neighborhood do you want to live in? And then we'd look at apartments in that neighborhood that landlords that agreed to be part of the project, uh, what apartments were available, and the person would go view one or more apartments and decide like, is this where I want to stay? Um, and the only requirement for people that were in the housing first term is, um, and they had consented to this as part of agreeing to the study, was they had to agree to be visited by some member of the mental health team um, at a minimum of once per week, although we were flexible about that as things went on. The overall project was um, across Canada. We had many partners. Um, in Toronto, the partners were um, uh, St. Michael's Hospital, um, are doing a lot of their research at the Center for Research um, in Inner City Health. Um, the City of Toronto, which had the contract with Housing Connections, um, CODA, which is the organization that I've been working with um, that um, has been the site for the, um, the ACT team part of the study. And then um, in terms of the intensive case management teams that were involved in the Housing First Arm, um, there were Toronto North Support Services and the Cross Boundaries um, um, Ethno-Racial Mental Health Centre. Um, and then uh, they also made sure, um, as part of the project, that they were getting input from people with lived experience. And in Toronto, they had a people with lived experience caucus involved um, in the study and providing input. Um, so overall, um, in, tr in the Toronto arm of the study, there were 560 people enrolled, 300 received a housing first intervention. So they got housing subsidy plus mental health team support. Um, some people, um, a sort of community treatment team, some people intensive case management team. Um, Two thirds were male and one third were female, 1% 1 transgendered. Um, and amongst the population in the Toronto arm of the study, the average participant had been homeless for nearly six years. So these aren't people that were homeless temporarily. These were um, the majority of people in the study were people who had been chronically homeless. Um, many of them had, had involvement with the criminal justice system in the past six months, and 50% um, were from a visible minority um, racialized community. Um, so I uh, just want to briefly talk about some of the outcomes. So in terms of housing outcomes, uh, the housing first arm uh, definitely outperformed the treatment as usual arm. And this is in the first year of the study. And one can see that even by the six month mark, um, uh, six months into the study, the housing first arm, over 70% of people had been housed versus uh, in the treatment as usual arm, only one quarter had, um, had been housed at that point. And then by a year into the study, it was close to 80% in the housing first term have been uh, successfully housed uh, versus one third in the treatment as usual arm. So in terms of getting people housed quickly, housing first um, uh, definitely works. Um, and then this is housing outcomes looking during the last year of the study and looking at the percentage of people um, who are housed in the last six months of the study. And uh, the blue arm is the housing first and the red arm is treatment as usual. And the people in the housing first arm um, over 60% were housed all of the time during that um, uh, the last six months of the study versus only 30% in the uh, treatment as usual arm. So, um, so definitely higher success rates with housing first versus treatment as usual in terms of people being stably housed. Um, I think this also demonstrates that the housing for, even with housing first, even with the intensive case management supports um, or ACT team supports that um, Housing first doesn't result in everybody being stably housed, um, and so I think there's even you know further room for us to work to figure out how can we help those people who are um, even with this intensity of service that they're still having difficulty maintaining stable housing. Um, they also found in the first 12 months of the study, the people in the housing first arm had fewer nights in uh, shelters, fewer emergency department visits, and fewer police detentions. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit briefly about um, with my team, what, what approaches we found had worked. And one of the major things I think was having two peer support workers on the team. So 20% of our overall case managers were peer support workers. And then um, we also had other people 
on our team that weren't identified as peer support workers, but also had lived experience with mental health issues on our team. And I think this really helped us a lot in terms of engagement with, um, with our clients and our peer support workers on our team have been amazing. Um, and so I, I think uh, for anyone who's um, looking to put together any kind of team working with this population, I think having peer support, I think is, is really um, uh, a huge, a huge, huge plus to, to success. Um, and we also had peer led groups, including uh, RAP uh, wellness recovery action plan groups, which is an evidence uh, based approach um, to helping people in their recovery. Um, and our team definitely focused on meaningful client choice all the way, as I talked about from uh, choice about where they wanted to live and then, uh, you know, choices about, uh, you know, what, what their goals are and focusing on what, what our clients' goals are. And all of our staff received recovery oriented training at the beginning, um, before they even, we even started as a team, uh, to intake clients. Um, so, um, there were challenges that we faced and I want to paint like an overly rosy picture that it was all like great. And as I mentioned, even the client I saw today who's been successfully housed for four years, she's still dealing with her addictions issues. Um, and some of the issues that a lot of clients have talked about um, is isolation. So with the Housing First model, people, most people are in scattered site apartments. Um, and uh, with that, uh, people can experience isolation in their apartments, um, especially if they don't have sort of a natural peer su um, supportive peer support network. Um, so one of our approaches to this has been where you connect people to drop-ins, recreational centers, and groups, both within our ACT team and, and other groups. Um, independent living isn't for everyone, and not everyone actually wants to live independently in their own apartment. We have had some clients that have wanted, preferred to live in a more supported housing environment, supportive housing environment, and then other clients, we've tried them a number of times in their own independent apartment, and it hasn't worked out for a variety of reasons, and then we've uh, housed them in a more supportive environment, and they've done well in a more supportive environment where they didn't do as well in their own independent apartment. And one of the reasons why some of our clients didn't do well in their own independent apartment was the issue about bringing the street inside to their apartment, um, unwanted guests, and uh, the expression I heard at the Housing First Conference I was at, someone talked about uh, managing the door. So some of our clients have had difficulty for a variety of reasons in terms of managing the door to their home in terms of who's coming in, and that sometimes led to problems with them maintaining housing stability, and um, oftentimes those issues can be um, ameliorated by a more supportive housing environment if that's a recurrent issue. Usually we would move the person initially to another independent apartment and talk with them about what had happened and work with them on seeing if they could do a better job managing the door um, in terms of who they were allowing into their apartment, but that didn't always work out. Um, so, and then for our team, our, our catchment area for our team was all of the city of Toronto, so the large catchment area. So um, people were on the move. Was, or, for our team, it was a requirement that people had to have um, uh, a car um, in order to um, uh, to get to the different uh, visit our different clients and we we focused on having the majority of our visits in the community at home and that's how our, our team does have the majority of our community visits in the community and I do about half my visits in the community and half my visits at the office but our case managers the majority of their visits are in the community um, so in terms of some other interventions that have been um, evidence-based um, uh, it's been shown that uh, respite care um, for people who are homeless. Respite Care is offering um, interim housing, uh, meals, on-site health care, and case management. Um, and that's been shown to be um, uh, an effective approach for people, especially uh, when they're transitioning from one level of care to another. Um, and then another evidence-based approach that there's um, a lot of studies on and there's websites devoted to is critical time interventions. And that's providing short-term case management to homeless persons with mental health problems during critical times of transition, such as discharge from hospital, prison, or shelter, um, and that people need additional support um, often during the, um, the first uh, six to 12 months after those transitions, um, during and after those transition times. Um, and that's what uh, the critical time intervention approach is designed to do is to provide that additional case management support to help people during those times of transitions. And that's been shown to, um, to reduce homeless nights for people. Um, and then uh, there's also been looked at um, uh, for people that are being discharged from hospital, um, short, very focused interventions to help people with their housing and income needs. And uh, one pilot project in, in London, Ontario, um, showed that a very 
um, this was a small pilot project, but it showed that a focused three-hour intervention of advocacy work and working to help people with their housing and income supports had a significant impact even six months later. Each uh, inner city health associates is an organization in Toronto of uh, physicians that's working with the homeless population. Um, and this includes psychiatrists, GPs, um, internal medicine physicians. Um, and uh, the goal of the overall organization is to develop innovative service delivery models from the homeless population. And uh, the overall mission is uh, to uh, end chronic homelessness related to illness and disability. Um, and to improve access to care and improve care coordination. Um, so, and the overall target um, is to provide care for those clients that are having difficulty access to care that are not connected to care. So, you know, what, we talked about barriers to care earlier. So one of the aspects of the physicians that are working uh, with the inner city health associates is there's no, no requirement for the person to have an ID or health card. Um, and it was negotiated with the, provincial government for these physicians to be paid um, an hourly rate for their work with the homeless so that, that they don't need to be, that the client doesn't have to have an OHIP card in order for that physician to get paid for their work. Um, and um, uh, providing on-site access to care so the physicians go into the shelters, um, into the drop-in centers um, to provide care, and uh, no need for a person to be referred by another doctor in order to access psychiatry. Um, so these are some of the sites. This isn't, this isn't actually an exhaustive list. There's even more sites than this, but these are some of the sites where each of physicians are working. Just in terms of considering some of the possible solutions, certainly we need to have uh, safe, affordable, permanent housing. Um, and we need to have partnerships across all levels. So all of us working together in terms of providing um, care. Uh, I did want to talk about uh, one excellent program that's been developed um, and this has been a modified approach of that critical time intervention model in terms of helping people um, who are not connected uh, with services to get connected. And that's the CATCH program, which is a coordinated access to care for the homeless program. Um, and uh, that's, this is a program that helps people who have unmet complex health care needs who are not already connected with services. So the CATCH homeless program is for people who are homeless and are not already connected to services, um, and uh, they may or may not have mental health or addiction problems. Um, but uh, if they're homeless and not yet connected to services, then this is a program that they can be referred to um, if they have complex needs that, that and need to be connected with services. Um, and the person is connected with a transitional case manager um, to help connect them to need to longer term services and supports. Um, and this has been a partnership. Uh, between uh, St. Mike's, CCAC, um, Inner City Health Associates, the, each of that I was talking about, and Toronto North Support Services, which are providing the case management. Um, and they're collaborating with a variety of um, service providers um, in the city, including the Toronto Drop-In Network, uh, the Peer Support Project, and Toronto Social Services. Um, so, um, just, so the people are connected to transitional case managers, um, and so far, they've had over a thousand referrals in the first three years of that program. And clients are usually seen within one to three weeks, so people are seen quickly. Um, and they don't usually, uh, and sorry, they don't need a health card or to access uh, this service. Um, so, in terms of that program, just wanted to say about how, how you would make a referral to that. Um, uh, the referral form is available on this website, www.catch-ed.ca. Uh, this was just. Uh, one physician talking about the uh, the success that um, uh, that they saw in terms of a client being connected with Catch uh, quickly, um, and um, and talking about how quickly um, the Catch case manager was often able to work with clients. Uh, this person said, if the service had not been available, the patient would certainly have required an admission to hospital and may even have attempted suicide, as indicated by his previous inability to cope with such a stressor. So, you know, potentially uh, life-saving. Um, just to briefly to cover a few other resources, um, there's the City of Toronto 2013 Guide to Services for People Who Are Homeless. Um, and that's available online. Uh, there's the 211 Toronto, uh, which you can dial or access via the web. Um, uh, 
Uh, I'm not going to go into detail about the Loft Community Services HIV AIDS Homeless Intervention Project because uh, two months from now, uh, Kay, who's the program director, is going to be giving a whole presentation here as part of the KC House uh, Mental Health Series talking about this program. Uh, but it does provide intensive case management for people with HIV who are homeless and works to get them connected with appropriate services um, and to get them housed. And um, that project has a number of different partners, um, including Casey House. Um, and then in terms of other resources, in terms of shelter and housing resources, um, you, you know, there's a huge number of, or there's quite a large number of shelters around Toronto, um, some specifically for youth, um, some specifically for refugees, um, and there's a central access number for that shelter system. Um, uh, as well, there's the um, Streets to Homes Assessment and Referral Center at, at Peter Street, 129 Peter Street, um, that provides 24-hour respite, as well as connecting people with other um, services there. Um, and then as an example of a medical respite care facility, there's the Sherburne Health Infirmary, which provides um, short-term health care um, for persons who are homeless while they're recovering from an acute medical condition, illness or injury. Um, at the Seton House Men's Shelter, um, which is actually one of the first places I started working with the homeless when I was a psychiatry resident, they have um, uh, nurses and psychiatrists and family doctors who provide um, care in their programs. And then there are also mental health and justice safe beds and generic safe beds where people can stay for up to 30 days, although um, often can be difficult, there's waiting lists often for those beds and it can be hard to get people in right away to those um, mental health and justice and generic safe beds. So that, those are also examples of a, a respite care. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a number of primary health care resources. I um, uh, want to highlight the hassle-free clinic that provides free medical care and counseling and sexual health. Um, and then there's a number of drop-in uh, programs around the city. It's the Toronto Drop-In Network, uh, which can be accessed on the web. Um, and then other resources are community detox, central access number for that, uh, 1-866-366-9513. Uh, there's public health, which provides harm reduction supplies uh, for per per people and, uh, and their case managers um, and workers. Um, and we use that um, resource to get harm reduction supplies for our clients. Um, and uh, there's also um, access one to get people connected with longer term case management and that team supports, although there's quite a waiting list for the people who refer to that these days. Um, mentioned before about the importance of ID and there's ID clinics um, uh, for people um, who don't have um, all the ID that they need um, that help people to get ID. They don't, they don't need to have ID to get ID, but they work with them to, to help them get their ID again. Um, and um, uh, there's also trustee programs, both voluntary trustee programs and the Office of the Public Guardian and Trustee. So this was a client quote from one of my clients on the ACT team. Uh, he said that since becoming part of the ACT team, um, I've overcome lifelong suicide attempts. I'm enjoying life, trying to succeed and go back to work. I'm seeing the good in life, being positive, and believing in myself, getting back my self-esteem. I see myself as somebody who is worthwhile, that is worth talking to and being with. Thank you.